With apologies for the delay, very good evening everybody, I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland, this is Live Irish Myths episode number 155. Tonight we are revisiting a theme that has come up a few times in the past, but with a new twist, we are talking about the young life of the great hero Fionn McCool, and in particular James Stevens' uh, lyrical retelling of the tale. You seem to enjoy so much the... A uh, two-part series where we read out the story of Toan McCarroll from the same author that I thought perhaps we might just continue with some more. It was very, very beautifully done. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, I'm apologies that tonight I am unable to stream on the Mythical Ireland community for some reason. Hence the technical hitch that delayed uh, the episode. I do apologize for that. Uh, perhaps somebody who's on the main Mythical Ireland page can share the live stream onto the uh, onto the uh, the YouTube uh, onto the <laughs> onto the <laughs> Mythical Ireland community. Anyway, uh, I, again uh, with apologies, it just wouldn't work. I couldn't get it to stream, and eventually I had to take off. It was giving me a warning that the Melon app uh, app is not enabled on the Mythical Ireland community, and I went in and checked, and it is. So I have no idea what's going on. Anyway, very good evening to you all. You're all very welcome. In the house tonight, Louise Sherrill is the first of the arrivers. Looking very spectral. Mm. How, how are you, Louise? Mariana Dunn is here. Hello, Mariana. Welcome to the library. Janet Moran is here also from sunny Boston. Brilliant stuff. We saw a little bit of sunshine today, but not much. Sheena Yusuf says, hi. Hello there, Sheena. Falcha. Good G on Laurel and Shaw. Uh, Guido Bruce is in the house. Good evening, all. Yes, indeed. Hello to you, Guido and Scott Doherty. Ah, there you are. Greetings. Yes, indeed. And there, all you are arriving and and commenting and saying hello, which is brilliant. Barbara Barney is there. Hello, Barbara. Trina Newark is in the house. Hello, Trina. Welcome along. Diary of a Ditch Witch. Tara Tyne. We're about to get ditchy. Witchy, <laughs> did she? <laughs> Whether you like it or not, just sitting down to a Viking costume and needed company. <laughs> uh, brilliant, very well. You're very welcome, Tara. Three parts, says Donna. Sounds wonderful. Well, it's a lot longer than the two and McCarroll story, and uh, we'll go at a similar pace, I think. Slow and steady does it, you know. Daisy Peters has arrived. Hello, Daisy. Now that I'm having lunch, but I couldn't help but be here. In our tour. Well, you're always very welcome, Daisy. Pull up a chair, grab yourself. Well, you seem to be uh, having your lunch, but uh, jo grab something nice and uh, sit and eat and drink and be merry. Hello, Anton and all the mighty tour. Wonderful to be here again for another great story, says Anne McCallum. A cloudy, chilly seven degrees Celsius this morning, but now lovely and sunny 17 Celsius. We had 17 Celsius today, too. And our forecasters are saying that by the end of the week, temperature will have fallen 10 degrees it's going to get very cold well colder joe butler will share to the mythical ireland community page thank you joe brilliant stuff you're very good stephen o'hara is in kilkenny he says hello to everybody hi stephen john main is looking forward to an enlightening evening hello john always a pleasure to have you in the library and uh, hope you are keeping well and the weather is treating you well out west Lillian Cruz is in Rio in Brazil. Lillian, always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoy the story. Rowan Grove is in Denver. Denver, Colorado. Hello, Rowan. Long time no see. <laughs> Cornelia Skipton is in a sunny and cool Maryland. Cornelia, you're very welcome. Porrick Barn is in County Leash. Not a bad place to be at all, Porrick. The River Tree is in Kentucky. Well, in the Boyne Valley. Welcome to the live stream. Nick Eska Casterton. Good evening, Anton. All the two. I hope you're safe and well. Autumn is here with a vengeance in the Midlands of England. Uh, cold, short days are coming in fast. Catherine Woodruff is in sunny Wisconsin. Glad to hear it's sunny stateside in a lot of places. Michael Darby is saying good day from down under. Very, very good morning to you, Michael. A very good Tuesday morning to you while we're still here in mon Monday evening. Theresa K. Drevdal is in Oregon. We love you. Ah, oh, that's very nice, Teresa. Thank you for joining us. And uh, it's great to have you in the library. Hope you enjoy this evening's 
first part of a tripartite episode uh, about Fionn McCool. Hello, nothing happening on YouTube yet, says Mandy. Hang on a second. Hopefully that's not true. Hello, nothing happening on YouTube yet, says Mandy. It's happening here. Uh, just had to check. Um, Mandy, you might reload or refresh or restart your phone. Hopefully um, it's just a hitch on your side. Halle, Halle B04 says, evening all. Found you on YouTube. Brilliant stuff. Great. Always remember, if Facebook is acting up, go to YouTube. If YouTube is acting up, go to Facebook. Best of both worlds. Brilliant stuff, Halle B04. Um, who am I missing? I do apologize. Barbara Kling is in Vermont. Oh, uh, let me silence my phone. I was distracted with the technical hitches early. Uh, trying to get the... Uh, sorry, I do apologize. Uh, I'm trying to get the episode underway and forgot to silence the phone. Barbara, you're very welcome. Hope life is treating you well in Vermont. Uh, Rowan Grove says, I enjoyed your presentation. Brilliant stuff. Good, good, good. Always good to hear that. And Diary of a Ditch Witch Tara says, it, it is definitely getting a bit ditchy at this stage. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What about Samhain when all the ditches come out? <laughs> Adina Sparks says, afternoon. Warm day here in New Mexico. Looking forward to today's reading. You're very welcome, Adina. Hope you enjoy it. Oh, Halle B04 is Sue Prenter. Hello, Sue. Good, good that we know who you are. That's always a help. Alan Taff is in Lyon. Hello there, Alan. Bonsoir, mon ami. Uh, Vicky Wallace Southerl is in the house. Hello there, Vicky. And if Evan is watching, hello, Evan. And Chili and the other thing that I can't remember that Vicky might prompt me on. Uh, Kate O'Neill is in Benidorm, usually Waterford. Nice change, Kate, if you don't mind me saying. I hope it's nice over there. Uh, great that you're able to tune in. Robin Rickman is in... Uh, Pennsylvania, where it's a perfect autumn day. Brilliant stuff, Robin. Welcome to the Mythical Ireland live stream. Tom Lawler says, good evening from Tipperary. Indeed, good evening to you, Tom. Always a great pleasure. Paul Campbell is watching from Galway City on the west coast of Ireland. Hello, Paul. Good evening. Tom King, our uh, our, our uh, forge master, I was going to say, our smith, the smith of the Tua is in the house. What a beautiful day at the Boyne Valley. Hope all in great form. Dram topped up and ready for story time. Enjoy. Brilliant. What episode number did you say, says Paul? Uh, yes, 155. Uh, Helen Hirsch Chatter is in the Black Hills. I came over from the other YouTube link. Ah, brilliant. Okay, well, so long as you're happy and it's readable, listenable and watchable and all the rest. Um, Merit Braun is in Switzerland saying good evening. Uh, hello to you, Merit. Uh, thank you for joining us. E hum Erica, thank you. In no, uh, Ipswich in Suffolk is in the house. Hello, Erica. Thank you for joining us on the live stream. Uh, Mark Munoz is in Albuquerque in New Mexico. Been way too long. Great to see you, Mark. Not the only New Mexican watching this evening. We are very glad to have your company. Miranda Hickey is in Dublin 1. Hello, Miranda. Fáilte Goji Mokharji Goléir i Bálea Achlia. And uh, welcome to the live stream. They're flying up the screen so fast that I can't keep up. Roisin Bricker is in Seattle, where it's a gorgeous day. All of the stateside viewers are reporting that the weather is fabulous. No inclement weather in the United States today. Brilliant stuff. Marianne Kindia is in Connecticut. Good evening. Good afternoon, Marianne. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. And um, May May Rinfer Zambrano, is that right? Is in Tralee in County Kerry. Hello, you're very welcome. May Rinfer. May Rinfer. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. C L V, Paul says in Roman numerals. Episode C L V. Brilliant stuff. Gary is in uh, South Dublin. Another fine day on the sod. Yes, and we're sharing that with our friends stateside who are all reporting fabulous weather. Roisin Bricker says, hi. Hello, indeed. Brady Ann Tussey says, good day all. So glad to be here today. We are glad to have you. What are we on now? Sorry. It's not to... Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 
Okay, it, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just it's just changed every time you log into Melon App. It, the layout changes. Ten minutes in, at seventy six viewers. Right, I think it's we should start. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter. Look, it's a perfect day in Texas. I tell you, there isn't one viewer from the states who isn't having wonderful weather. Daisy is reporting that uh, it's spring in Brazil, of course, in the southern hemisphere. You know, might be. The uh, days are shortening here, but they're lengthening there. Michael Foley is in the rebel county of County Cork. Up the rebels. Sorry, that's not the one. Angel, I'll get to you in a second. I'm after losing Michael Foley's comment. Yes, indeed, Michael. Good evening from Gundaloo. The, the wee county. Janelle is uh, saying oh, enjoy, she's enjoying a cup of Irish breakfast tea on a typical Washington overcast day. <gasps> Shocker, there's somebody in the United States who's not having a lovely sunny day. Janelle, you are the first person from the States to report that you're not having perfectly good weather. Angel Barboni is saying hello to the Tua. It's been a long time. You are very welcome, Angel. It's great to see you. Connecticut has had rain on and off all day, says Marianne. Sounds like Ireland. Shira Land says hi from North Carolina. Good evening to you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And Jade Tink. Tinkler it tells us that it's a pretty spring sunrise here in Australia. Another Australian viewer, a very good morning to you. Welcome, welcome. Brilliant. And Beth Kelly is in Oklahoma. Fault you, uh, slaunch you, and all of that. Good afternoon to you. Right, let's get underway, shall we? This evening we are reading from James Stevens's Irish F Word Tales. Uh, we were reading from that over the past two episodes where we read. Uh, the story of Tone McCarroll. And uh, people seem to really, really beautifully enjoy his wonderfully lyrical uh, retelling of the story, which has obviously taken some poetic and uh, artistic license, but which is uh, beautiful all the same, you know. Joe Hickey's in Somerset says, hello. Good evening to you, Joe. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Larissa Kama is in uh, Chile, Oregon. So good to see everyone here on this chilly fall day. Good evening, Larissa. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Stacy Herman Lawrence says hello from Ohio. Hello to all our Ohioan friends. Samantha Healy is uh, asking if everybody's keeping well. All good so far, it seems to be anyway. So welcome. Anyway, this is chapter one of a number of chapters. As I said, I'm going to read this in three episodes. Yes, hang on, just very quickly, sorry, I do apologise. Brilliant, yeah, yeah. Be just enough for an hour's worth, I think. 13 minutes, okay. Fionn got his first training among women. There is no wonder in that, for it is the pup's mother teaches it to fight, and women know that fighting is a necessary art, although men pretend there are others that are better. These were the women druids, Bovmal and Lia Lochra. And that is the beginning of the story of the boyhood of Fionn. Told in manuscript form in a very short way in the tale Machnivarha Find, uh, the boyhood deeds of Finn. And that plays a fairly substantial role in the first of the mm, yes the first of the mythical ireland monographs finn and the salmon of knowledge mythology toponymy and cosmology which you can purchase for the princely sum of 10 euros on the mythical ireland website mythicalireland.com signed copy if you buy one through the website i'll sign it for you and send it to you it will be wondered why his own mother did not train him in the first natural savageries of existence, but she could not do it. She could not keep him with her for dread of the clan Morna. The sons of Morna had been fighting and intriguing for a long time to oust her husband, Uil, U -A -I -L, from the captaincy of the Fianna of Ireland. And they had ousted him at last by killing him. And of course, the Fianna were the warrior band, uh, which uh, which uh, Fionn was later to become uh, the leader of. Saying a quick hello to Robert Friend, who has joined us, Mark Gordon in Iowa. 
Um, good evening to both of you and uh, make yourselves comfortable. Mavanway is whispering. She thinks that she can sneak in late and we won't notice. <laughs> Falcha, Mavanway, make yourself comfortable. Hello, indeed. Alan Curran is in Drogheda. Very good to have the most local viewer. Sure, I could nearly lean out the window and uh, you wouldn't even have to have an internet connection to hear the story. It was the only way they could get rid of such a man. But it was not an easy way. For what Fionn's father did not know in arms could not be taught to him, even by Morna. Still, the hound that can wait will catch a hare at last, and even Mananon sleeps. Fionn's mother was beautiful. Hmm. It's very interesting. Uh, Stevens has a, a footnote for the, the name Fionn. And he says, pronounce Fionn, F-E-W-N, to rhyme with tune, Fionn. No, that is not how Fionn is pronounced. I'm sorry. And I don't think it ever was pronounced like that. But I suppose if you're not local um, and you maybe don't speak the language or you never have done, maybe you don't quite know. Maybe that's the way it was spoken in a particular dialect where he happened to hear it once upon a time. But there you go. Maria. Yes, yes. Helen is reminding me that a wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. Maria, uh, good sight. Is a uh, late zoom in, sorry, but attentive nonetheless. Brilliant, happy to enjoy Irish myths. Good evening, all together from Koblenz in Germany. Sorry, my camera thing is in the way. I need to figure out a better setup for that, don't I? I really do. The not chosen. I know you told us who you, what your name was. I don't remember, and that's that de demands an apology from me. So I am sorry, but good evening. And, and Joe Hickey, yes, that is a funny fion. Like, fion, fion, rhyming with tune. Fion McCool. No, never heard it pronounced that way. Unless, I was even going to say, maybe in the Highlands of Scotland, that's how it's pronounced. But <laughs> Fion is the sound he makes when he runs past quickly. <laughs> Tyler, that's a good one. That's straight out of my own uh, uh, book of jokes. Fionn's mother was beautiful, long-haired Murne, M-U-I-R-N-E. So she was. She is always referred to. She was the daughter of Teig, T-E-I-G-U-E, -E, which I gather is probably an earlier uh, version of Teig, the son of Nuada from Fairy, and her mother was Ethlin. That is, her brother was Lou of the Long Hand himself, and with a god, and such a god, for brother, we may marvel that she could have been in dread of Morna or his sons, or of anyone. But women have strange loves, strange fears, and these are so bound up with one another that the thing which is presented to us is not often the thing that is to be seen. However it may be, when Uil died, Murna got married again to the king of Kerry. Somebody said they were in Kerry, didn't they? Good evening indeed. Uh, Dunworks is saying hello from Bally Finn. Good evening to you. Thank you for joining the live stream. The Vanway says, I know we have Fionn as a girl's name in Wales, pronounced Fionn. Is it F F Fionn? Archaeotonomy database is in the house, says this is going to be a great episode. I can feel it. Snapper Earl has joined us. Hello there. Good evening. She gave the child to Bovmal and Lea Luachra to rear, and we may be sure that she gave injunctions with him and many of them. The youngster was brought to the woods of Schlieff Bloom and was nursed there in secret. So Fionn was actually raised in Schlieff, the Schlieff Bloom Mountains. Somebody else said they were watching from Leash, not too far away. You're probably in the shadow of Schlieff Bloom. I'm afraid I'm very warm. I'm going to have to undress for a moment. I do apologize. As if by magic, the jumper disappears. 
Oh dear. Uh, I was going to say I lost my place, but I didn't. It is likely the women were fond of him. It is likely the women were fond of him. I mean, were they or were they not? <laughs> For other than Fionn, there was no life about them. He would be their life. And their eyes may have seemed as twin benedictions resting on the small fair head. He was fair-haired, and it was for his fairness that he was afterwards called Fionn. But at this period, and you'll know this if you've read the mo monograph, he was known as Jevna, D-E-I-M-N-E. -E. And Jevna actually means certainty. And I think the reason that he was called certainty was because he was certain to become a great leader. He was cut out for it from birth. His, it was his destiny. They saw the food they had put into his little frame reproduce itself lengthways and sideways in tough inches. Oh, that's brilliantly put, isn't it? And in springs and energies that crawled at first and then toddled and then ran. He had birds for playmates, but all the creatures that live in a wood must have been his comrades. There would have been for there would have been for little Fionn long hours of lonely sunshine when the world seemed just sunshine and a sky. There would have been hours as long when existence passed like a shade among shadows in the multitudinous tappings of rain that dripped from leaf to leaf in the wood and slipped so to the ground. He would have known little snaky paths, narrow enough to be filled by his own small feet or a goat's, and he would have wondered where they went, and have marvelled again to find that, wherever they went, they came at last, through loops and twists of the branchy wood, to his own door. This sounds very Tolkien-esque, doesn't it? Yes. He may have thought of his own door as the beginning and end of the world, as in, the road goes ever on and on down from the door where it began. Whence all things went and whither all things came. Brilliant stuff. Bally Finn means the town of Fionn. It's on one of the foothills of the Schlieve Blooms. There you go. And there's the exact place. Brilliant stuff. Porik says, I'm in Mount Melik. Only a few minutes from the Schlieve Blooms. Brilliant stuff, Porik. Fionn's home territory. The not chosen says he's watching in Cavan. Brilliant. Excellent, excellent. Nora Gaffney O'Connor is in the house. I did spot you sneaking in late, but that's okay. You'll have to stay behind for 10 minutes afterwards and there will be a test. Write out 100 lines. I must not be late for live arguments. <laughs> Barbara Murphy is, is in uh, Tucson. The Rowan Grove says she heard an F word and her system locked up. Whoops. Uh, perhaps he did not see the lark for a long time, but he would have heard him far out of sight in the endless sky, thrilling and thrilling until the world seemed to have no other sound but that clear sweetness. And what a world it was to make that sound. Whistles and chirps, coos and caws and croaks would have grown familiar to him. And he could at last have told which brother of the great brotherhood was making the noise he heard at any moment. The wind, too. He would have listened to its thousand voices as it moved in all seasons and in all moods. Perhaps a horse would stray into the thick screen about his home and would look as solemnly on Fionn as Fionn did on it. Or, coming suddenly on him, the horse might stare all a cock with eyes and ears and nose, one long-drawn facial extension. Ear he turned and bounded away with manes all over him and hoofs all under him and tails all around him. Isn't that brilliant? A solemn-nosed, stern-eyed cow would amble and stamp in his wood to find a flyless shadow or a strayed sheep would poke its gentle muzzle through leaves. Tarini Pendleton is in Laguna Beach, California, Turtle Island. Brilliant stuff, Tarini. You're very welcome along. Um, Nora is saying, go, go on, you mad joke. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I Sorry, I am no match for... Uh, 
uh, Tara Tyne's Diary of a Ditch Witch. I just, you know, I can't paint my face like she does either. You know, a lady of many talents, it has to be said. Um, where was I? Mm -hmm. A boy, he might think, as he stared on a staring horse. A boy cannot wag his tail to keep the flies off, and that lack may have saddened him. He may have thought that a cow can snort and be dignified at the one moment, and that timidity is comely in a sheep. He would have scolded the jackdaw and tried to outwhistle the throstle and wondered why his pipe got tired when the blackbirds didn't. <laughs> Brilliant. That's very interesting, um, the full Irish uh, Gary. There are many strong connections of Fionn around South Dublin foothills. At, on the top of almost every hill, there's some type of Neolithic structure or a hinge. Yeah. Uh, uh, Seafin is the seat of uh, Fionn, isn't it? Um, just across from Seahan. Seafin, Seahan. There are three, aren't there, on peaks up there in the mountains? Three cairns that basically look across at each other. There would be flies to be watched. Slender atoms in yellow gauze that flew, and filmy specks that flittered, and sturdy, thick-ribbed brutes that pounced like cats, and bit like dogs, and flew like lightning. He may have mourned for the spider in bad luck who caught that fly. There would be much to see and remember and compare, and there would be always his two guardians. The flies change from second to second. One cannot tell if this bird is a visitor or an inhabitant, and a sheep is just sister to a sheep. But the women were as rooted as the house itself. Isn't that another fabulous line? The women were as rooted as the house itself. Brilliant stuff. And there is chapter one. Keep watching because there's more chapters coming. Hmm. See Finn, yeah. Uh, Joe Hickey is asking, is Ballyhickey significant in any legends? Ballyhickey, not familiar with it, Joe. Where is that? Whereabouts is that Ballyhickey? I might look that up in the old place names book later if we haven't got any answers to it in the meantime. Chapter two. Were his nurses comely or harsh looking? Fionn would not know. This was the one who picked him up when he was when he fell. And that was the one who patted his bruise. This one said, mind you do not tumble in the well. And that one, mind the little knees among the nettles. <laughs> but he did tumble and record that the only notable thing about a well is that it is wet. What a, perspic what a perspicacious young man he was. And as for nettles... If they hit him, he hit back. He slashed into them with a stick and brought them low. There was nothing in wells or nettles. Only women dreaded them. One patronised women and instructed them and comforted them, for they were afraid about one. They thought that one should not climb a tree. Next week, they said at last, you may climb this one. And next week lived at the end of the world. But the tree that was climbed was not worthwhile when it had been climbed twice. There was a bigger one nearby. There were trees that no one could climb with vast shadow on one side and vaster sunshine on the other. It took a long time to walk round them and you could not see their tops. It was pleasant to stand on a branch that swayed and sprang, and it was good to stare at an impenetrable roof of leaves and then climb into it. How wonderful the loneliness was up there. When he looked down, there was an undulating floor of leaves, green and green and greener to the very blackness of greeniness. And when he looked up, there were leaves again, green and less green and not green at all up to a very snow and blindness of greeniness. And above and below and around there was sway and motion, the whisper of leaf on leaf, 
and the eternal silence to which one listened and at which one tried to look. When he was six years of age, his mother, beautiful, long-haired Myrna, came to see him. She came secretly, for she feared the sons of Morna. And she had paced through lonely places in many counties before she reached the hut in the wood and the cot where he lay with his fists shut and sleep gripped in them. He awakened, to be sure. He would have, have one ear that would catch an unusual voice, one eye that would open, however sleepy the other one was. She took him in her arms and kissed him, and she sang a sleepy song until the small boy slept again. We may be sure that the eye that could stay open stayed open that night as long as it could, and that the one ear listened to the sleepy song until the song got too low to be heard, until it was too tender to be felt vibrating along those soft arms, until Fionn was asleep, asleep again, with a new picture on his little head and a new notion to ponder on. Sounds a bit like when Frodo is in uh, Rivendell in Lord of the Rings in uh, The Fellowship of the Ring. And uh, Bil Bilbo starts to recite a, uh, a song and uh, Frodo sort of hears it in his sleep. The mother of himself, his own mother. But when he awakened, she was gone. She was going back secretly in dread of the sons of Morna, slipping through gloomy woods, keeping away from habitations, getting by desolate and lonely ways to her lord in Kerry. Perhaps it was he that was afraid of the sons of Morna. And perhaps she loved him. That is chapter two. New Zealand. Aotearoa here, says uh, somebody whose name I can't pronounce. Hello there. Good morning to the New Zealanders. Ah, it's uh, brilliant to see you in the house, uh, in the library. Hope you're enjoying the story. And uh, Des Desiree Marie is in the house, says good evening. Good evening to you indeed, Callum. Barrett is saying good evening all. Falchus launch you, Sonny Rahan says, I love you. There you go. What can I say? Tara Weston, I presume you're talking to Fionn. Tara Weston does comely mean the opposite of harsh looking. <laughs> comely means, you know, beautiful, nice to look at. And the not chosen confirms that, yes, I have battered many a nettle to death, lol. <laughs> Tuberfin, yes, indeed, just out the road here. Uh, about a mile, maybe a little bit more, just about a mile or so, is the townland of Tuberfin, the well of Fionn. Brilliant stuff. Let me see if I'm missing anyone else. I think there's a wedge tomb in Ballyhickey near County Clare. Don't know it now, Joe, but perhaps somebody else can can help. Sonny Rahan is in Pakistan. Very good night. Is it still nighttime in Pakistan or is it after midnight? Good night or good morning to you. Uh, nice of you to join us. Willie, Willow, Willow Moon is saying hi there. Good evening to you. Um, Paul Alborl, who's on the Alabama coast, says hello, hello, Paul. And uh, yeah, we we'll look, we'll, we'll maybe, we'll maybe get a chance to look up Bally Bally Hickey uh, in a in a wee while. In a wee while, hey, maybe we will, maybe we will. Now, the women druids, his guardians. This is chapter three. Belonged to his father's people. Bovmal was Uol's sister and, consequently, Fionn's aunt, aunt. Only such a blood tie could have bound them to the clan Bashkne, for it is not easy, having moved in the world of court and camp, to go hide with a baby in the wood and to live as they must have lived in terror. And remember that if you're trying to hide out in Ireland, okay, it's a little, probably a little bit easier in former times when there's more forest. Ireland is a very small country, much smaller than most states in the US. Uh, so, you know, you'd you'd be doing well to hide, to, to find a, a, a hiding place that nobody was going to stumble upon, you know. AJ is saying hello from the gorgeous Great Lakes. Fall is in the air. Yes, it is indeed. But it's, of course, spring in New Zealand, as it is also, Daisy has reminded us, in uh, Brazil. What stories they would have told the child of the sons of Morna. Of Morna himself, the huge-shouldered, stern-eyed, violent Connacht man. 
and of his sons, young Gaul MacMorna in particular, as huge-shouldered as his father, as fierce in the onset, but merry-eyed when the other was grim, and bubbling with a laughter that made men forgive even his butcheries. Of Conan Mail, MacMorna, his brother, gruff as a badger, bearded like a boar, bald as a crow, and with a tongue that could manage an insult where another man could not find even a stammer. His boast was that when he saw an open door, he went into it, and when he saw a closed door, he went into it. <laughs> I love it. When he saw a peaceful man, he insulted him, but when he met a man who was not peaceful, he insulted him. There was Gara Dov MacMorna and Savage Art Og, who cared as little for their own skins as they did for the next man's, and Gara must have been rough indeed to have earned in that clan the name of the rough MacMorna. There were others, wild Connacht men all, as untamable, as unaccountable as their as their own wonderful countryside. Of course, Connacht is out west, where you have the likes of Connemara, very wild and inhospitable and rugged places, where you would find the wild men. Again, cue reference to Lord of the Rings. Janelle says, at least he didn't discriminate. <laughs> Joe Hickey says, consistent fella that. Yeah. It's like, you know, don't worry, don't worry, don't feel insulted. I despise all of you with equal aplomb. Uh, Julianne Osborne is in the house from the Pacific Northwest saying hello specifically to Tom King. Hello, Julianne. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Excellent. Fionn would have heard. Much of them, and it is likely that he practised on a nettle at taking the head off Gull, and that he hunted a sheep from cover in the implacable manner he intended later, for Conan the swearer. But it is of Oil Macbashkne he would have heard most. With what a dilation of spirit the ladies would have told tales of him, Fionn's father how their voices would have become a chant as feet was added to feet, F-E-A-T, glory piled on glory. The most famous of men and the most beautiful, the hardest fighter, the easiest giver, the kingly champion, the chief of the Fianna Na Heron. Tales of how he had been waylaid and got free, of how he had been generous and got free, of how he had been angry and went marching with the speed of an eagle and the direct onfall of a storm, while in front and at the sides, angled from the prow of his terrific advance, were fleeing multitudes who did not dare to wait and scarce had time to run. And of how at last, when the time came to quell him, nothing less than the whole might of Ireland was sufficient for that great downfall. We may be sure that on these adventures, Fionn was with his father, going step for step with the long striding hero and heartening him mightily. And that is chapter three. I hope you're all enjoying yourselves. Everybody comfortable? Mine is water, just in case you're wondering. Yes, indeed. No, honestly, it is high. It is high, high, high. Good. Um, how many have we read? Oh, we're exactly halfway through the text. Good. Nice pace. Chapter four. He was given good training by the women in running and leaping and swimming. Q reference to... The Jedi training. And uh, never mind. One of them would take a thorn switch in her hand, and Fionn would take a thorn switch in his hand, and each would try to strike the other running round a tree. You had to go fast to keep away from the switch behind. For, and a small boy feels like a switch. Sorry. And a small boy feels a switch. Fionn would run his best to get away from that prickly stinger. But how he would run when it was his turn to deal the strokes. With reason, too, for his nurses had suddenly grown implacable. They pursued him with a savagery 
which he could not distinguish from hatred, and they swished him well whenever they got the chance. Fionn learned to run. After a while, he could buzz around a tree like a maddened fly, and oh, the joy when he felt himself drawing from the switch and gaining from behind on its bearer. How he strained and panted to catch on that pursuing person and pursue her and get his own switch into action. He learned to jump by chasing hares in a bumpy field. Up went the hare and up went Fionn. And away with the two of them, hopping and popping across the field. If the hare turned while Fionn was after it, sorry, I'll start that sentence again. I appear to be making a few little mistakes, almost as if that's not water that I'm drinking. If the, <laughs> it is, honestly, if the hare turned while Fionn was after her, it was switch for Fionn. So that in a while, it did not matter to Fionn which way the hare jumped, for he could jump that way too. Long ways, sideways, or baw ways. That's B-A-W hyphen ways. Fionn hopped where the hare hopped. And at last, he was the owner of a hop that any hare would give an ear for. He was taught to swim, and it may be that his heart sank when he fronted the lesson. The water was cold. It was deep. One could see the bottom leagues below, millions of miles below. Bit of an exaggeration. What do you think, Nora Gaffney O'Connor? You would have taught Fionn to swim, I'm sure. A small boy might shiver as he stared into that wink and blink and twink of brown pebbles and murder of these impl sorry, and these implacable women threw him in the devils. Perhaps he would not go in at first. He may have smiled at them and coaxed and hung back. It was a leg and an arm gripped then, a swing for Fionn, and out and away with him, plop and flop for him, down into the chill deep death for him, and up with a splutter, with a sob, with a grasp at everything that caught nothing, with a wild flurry, with a raging despair, with a bubble and snort as he was hauled again down and down and down, and found as suddenly that he had been hauled out. Fionn learned to swim until he could pop into the water like an otter and slide through it like an eel. He used to try to chase a fish the way he chased hares in the bumpy field. But there are terrible spurts in a fish. It may be that a fish cannot hop, but he gets there in a flash. And he isn't there in another. Up or down, sideways or endways, it is all one to a fish. He goes and is gone. He twists this way and disappears the other way. He is over you when he ought to be under you. And he is biting your toe when you thought you were biting his tail. You cannot catch a fish by swimming, but you can try. <laughs> and Fionn tried. He got a grudging commendation from the terrible women when he was able to slip noiselessly in the tide, swim under the water to where a wild duck was floating, and grip it by the leg. Quo, said the duck, and he disappeared before he had time to get the ack out of him. <laughs> Quack. <laughs> so the time went, and Fionn grew long and straight and tough like a sapling, limber as a willow, and with the flirt and spring of a young bird. One of the ladies may have said, He is shaping very well, my dear. And the other replied, As is the morose privilege of an aunt, he will never be as good as his father. But their hearts must have overflowed in the night, in the silence, in the darkness when they thought of the living swiftness they had fashioned and that dear fair head. Brilliant stuff. That is chapter four. Up the women. We're fabulous. Awesome swimmers, says Nora. Like the salmon. Keep up, Fionn. Yes, indeed. Brilliant stuff. Mavanway says, I watched an otter fishing in the river last summer. It didn't notice me close by. It moved like the water itself. Otters are fascinating creatures. We see them in the Boyne in Drogheda here sometimes. 
Kathy Maydeo is here for her lunch break. Brilliant. Three cheers for Kathy Maydeo. Hooray. 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 Brilliant. Up ya boy ya. Or in this case, up ya girl ya. Uh, Irish technical thinker is just home from a karate class. I was about to eat dinner. Hope I didn't miss much. Well, the truth of the matter is you missed about half the chapter. But look, the brilliant thing about these episodes is they're recorded. So you can go back and watch it again. But uh, good evening to you, Marcus. Hope all is well in uh, Bail Farishta. Michael Pike is in the house. Hello, Michael. Didn't see you there. He's sneaking in when you thought nobody was noticing. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Robin Rickman. Ah, oh, life is drawing me away from story time. Good evening. All. I'll be back next week. We'll see you next week, Robin. Don't forget to watch the end of the tale uh, on the on the playback. Okay, I think we'll carry on. Sean is a magnificent story. It certainly is. I couldn't agree more. Chapter five. One day, his guardians were agitated. They held confabulations at which Fionn was not permitted to assist. A man who passed by in the morning had spoken to them. They fed the man, and during his feeding, Fionn had been shooed from the door as if he were a chicken. When the stranger took the road, the women went with him a short distance. As they passed, the man lifted a hand and bent a knee to Fionn. My soul to you, young master, he said, and as he said it, Fionn knew that he could have the man's soul, or his boots, or his feet, or anything that belonged to him. When the women returned, they were mysterious and whispery. They chased Fionn into the house, and when they got him in, they chased him out again. <laughs> Quite capricious, these ladies, aren't they? They chased each other around the house for another whisper. They calculated things by the shape of clouds by lengths of shadows, by the flight of birds, by two flies racing on a flat stone, by throwing bones over their left shoulders, and by every kind of trick and game and chance that you could put a mind to. They sound like two right soothsayers, don't they? What do you think, Tara Tyne? Do they sound like ditch witches? They put Fionn, sorry, they told Fionn he must sleep in a tree that night. And they put him under bonds, not to sing or whistle or cough or sneeze until the morning. Megan is listening to the tale while she cleans the chimney. Brilliant stuff. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Like, you know, I find it more comfortable to sit on a chair and have a dram in hand. But like, if cleaning the chimney is the sort of thing that endears you to the uh, tones of a good story, fair enough. Barb Jordan is in the house. We'll have to catch up. That's fine. As I was just saying, all uh, recorded for replay later. Irish technical thinker. Yes, indeed. Keep up the good fight. Yes, thanks. Absolutely. Like the young Fionn himself. As he was known, Jevna. Fionn did sneeze. He never sneezed so much in his life. He forgot to take his antihistamines. He sat up in the tree and nearly sneezed himself out of it. Flies got up his nose two at a time. One up each nose, but I presume that should be each nostril, and his head nearly fell off the way he sneezed. What an exaggeration. That's typical the way the Irish tell a story, exaggerate every detail. Trina reminds us that Irish women still celebrate the heritage of these women with the sacred attribute, the wooden spoon, the dreaded wooden spoon. Oh yes, absolutely they did. You're doing that on purpose, said a savage whisper from the foot of the tree but Fionn was not doing it on purpose he tucked himself into a fork the way he had been taught and he passed the crawliest tickliest night he had ever known after a while he did not want to sneeze he wanted to scream and in particular he wanted to come down from the tree but he did not scream nor did he leave the tree his word was passed, and he stayed in his tree as silent as a mouse and as watchful until he fell out of it. In the morning, a band of travelling poets were passing, and the women handed Fionn over to them. This time, they could not prevent him overhearing. The sons of Morna, they said. And Fionn's heart might have swelled with rage, 
but that it was already swollen with adventure. And also, the expected was happening. Behind every hour of their day and every moment of their lives lay the sons of Morna. Fionn had run after them as deer, he jumped after them as hares, he dived after them as fish. They lived in the house with him, they sat at the table and ate his meat. One dreamed of them, and they were expected in the morning, as the sun is. They knew only too well that the son of Uil was living, and they knew that their own sons would know no ease while that son lived. For they believed in those days that like breeds like, and that the son of Uil would be Uil with additions. I <laughs> love that. His guardians knew that their hiding place must at last be discovered, and that when it was found, the sons of Morna would come. They had no doubt of that, and every action of their lives was based on that certainty. Uh, Jevna, uh, certainty, <laughs> never mind. For no secret can remain secret. Some broken soldier trampling home to his people will find it out. A herd seeking his strayed cattle or a band of travelling musicians will get the wind of it. How many people will move through even the remotest wood in a year? The crows, see what I was telling you about, it's hard to find a place in Ireland where you could hide you know, for a long time without somebody noticing you. It's a small country. It's, a, it's an island at the end of the day. It's not that big. Some broken soldier tramping home to his people will find it out. A herd seeking his strayed cattle or a band of travelling musicians will get the wind of it. How many people will move through even the remotest wood in a year? The crows will tell a secret if no one else does. And under a bush... Behind a clump of bracken, what eyes may, may there not be? But if your secret is legged like a young goat, if it is tongued like a wolf, one can hide a baby, but you cannot hide a boy. He will rove unless you tie him to a post, and he will whistle then. The sons of Morna came, but there were only two grim women living in the lonely hut to greet, greet them. Excuse me. Oh, I do not want to start doing that now. I definitely don't. We may be sure they were well greeted. One can imagine Gull's merry stare, taking in all that could be seen. Cunan's grim eye raking the women's faces, while his tongue raked them again. The rough MacMorna shouldering here and there in the house and about it, with maybe a hatchet in his hand. And Art Og coursing farther afield, and vowing that if the cub was there, he would find him. One more chapter to go for this evening's episode. Not forgetting this is the first of three. Love the exaggeration, says Donna Ferrer. Yes, indeed. It, I, I think it's splendid writing. Michael Trot says, hello, all the Tua Kiora, also from New Zealand. Spring morning to this shape-shifting tale. Brilliant stuff. Good morning to you, Michael. Thank you for joining us from the far side of the world. So wonderful to have some New Zealanders in the house. You're in the plural. There's another one here. And I think a couple of Australians as well, which is fantastic. Brilliant stuff. Mark Gordon is sorting family photos while listening. Brilliant stuff. Excellent. Right. One more chapter to go. But Fionn was gone. He was away, bound with his band of poets for the Galtees. And of course, that's the Galtee Mountains. It is likely they were junior poets come to the end of a year's training and returning to their own province to see again the people at home and to be wondered at and exclaimed at as they exhibited bits of the knowledge which they had brought from the great schools. Knowledge was such an important thing. Knowledge and wisdom, the old stories. They counted for so much that, in fact, the poet, the uh, chief Olive, uh, was second in rank to the king. They would know tags of rhyme and tricks about learning, which Fionn would hear of. And now and again, as they rested in a glade or by the brink of a river, they might try their lessons over. They might even refer to the Oam Wands, on which the first words of their tasks and the opening lines of poems were cut. 
that's very interesting, isn't it? The idea that Owen was carved onto wood. I mean, that's been mentioned as, a, you know, but th to find such relics is extremely difficult because wood is perishable, you know. Um, I just, I often wondered whether it was the case that some of the symbols that we see on the megalithic art on the great stones of the uh, the uh, the cairns, the Neolithic cairns, uh, weren't also carved into items of wood, um, you know, back then. And it is likely that being new to these things, they would talk of them to a youngster and thinking that his wits would be no better than their own. They might have explained to him how Oom was written, but it is far more likely that his women guardians had already started him at those lessons. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing, Michael Trot. Oum, that's how you pronounce it, yeah. Some people say Ogham. Oum, yeah, that's exactly it. The notches that are generally carved on stone, but uh, obviously also on wood, possibly, you know. Thank you, Daisy. You're very good and uh, blushing. <clears throat> Still, this band of young birds would have been of infinite interest to Fionn, not on account of what they had learned, but because of what they knew. All the things that he should have known as by nature, the look, the movement, the feeling of crowds, the shouldering and intercourse of man with man, the clustering of houses and how people bore themselves in and about them, the movement of armed men and the homecoming look of wounds, tales of births and marriages and deaths, the chase with its multitudes of men and dogs, all the noise, the dust, the excitement of mere living. Yeah, I have to say, James Stevens, you are were a wonderful writer. Absolutely beautifully done. Uh, first published in 1924, almost a century ago, 97 years ago now. Those to Fionn, New come from leaves. Sorry. I just needed to read that sentence because it didn't make any sense to me and it still kind of only half makes sense. These, to Fionn, new come from leaves and shadows and the dipple and dapple of a wood, would have seemed wonderful. And the tales they would have told of their masters, their looks, fads, severities, sillinesses would have been wonderful also that band should have chattered like a rookery they must have been young for one time a leinster man came on them a great robber named fiacul macona and he killed the poets he chopped them up and chopped them down he did not leave one poetine of them all he put them out of the world and out of life so that they stopped being. And no one could tell where they went or what had really happened to them. And it is a wonder indeed that one can do that to anything, let alone a band. If they were not youngsters, the bold vehicle could not have managed them all. Or perhaps he too had a band, although the record does not say so. But kill them he did, and they died that way. Fionn saw that deed and his blood must have been cold enough as he watched the great robber coursing the poets as a wild dog rages in a flock. And when his turn came, when they were all dead and the grim red-handed man trod at him, Fionn may have shivered but he would have shown his teeth and laid roundly on the monster with his hands. Perhaps he did that and perhaps for that he was spared. Who are you? roared the staring black mouth with the red tongue squirming in it like a frisky fish. The son of Oil, son of Bashkna, quoth Hardy Fionn. And at that, the robber ceased to be a robber. The murderer disappeared. The black rimmed chasm packed with red fish and precipices, changed to something else. 
and the round eyes that had been popping out of their sockets and trying to bite changed also. There remained a laughing and crying and loving servant who wanted to tie himself into knots if that would please the son of his great captain. Fionn went home on the robber's shoulder, and the robber gave great snorts and made great jumps and behaved like a first-rate horse. For this same Fiacul was the husband of Bovmal, Fionn's aunt. He had taken to the wilds when Clan Bashkina was broken, and he was at war with a world that had dared to kill his chief. And there endeth part one of the story of the boyhood of Fionn. Parts two and three to come in the next episodes. Um, if you want to remind me of the name, was it was, was it Ballyhickey, was it? I might just look that up. Um, can't remember who was asking, but uh, was it Donna or was it Joe or was it, uh, per, forgive me, I can't, I can't uh, precisely remember who it was who was asking about that place name. Um, I am saying hello to the brother of Dunworks uh, and I'm shouting out to Dan in Portugal who is watching. Hello, Dan in Portugal. Hope it's nice and warm uh, there. Uh, brilliant. Uh, yeah, uh, Joe Joe Hickey. Sorry, it was Joe Hickey. Yeah. Uh, Ballyhickey. Ballyhickey, is that what you said? Let me just, 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 just for a second, let me consult the uh, the library. Also, to mention MacNeever have filmed, just in case, let me just do that. Ballyhickey. I am here referring to Irish names of places uh, by P.W. Joyce. I have it in three, three uh, volumes. I don't know why I'm speaking with a funny Northern Ireland accent all of a sudden. Ballyhickey. Let me have a look. There are so many ballys. There are pages and pages and pages and pages of ballys. Bally, 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 mully, bally me, bally McNamee, bally Lunon, bally Lou, bally Luby, bally Lachlan, bally Loch Low, bally Loch Rain, bally Lugnanon, bally Luog, bally Lurgan, bally Lurkin, bally Linen, bally Lynch, bally Nabella. Do you, do you believe me that there are many ballys? What was it? Bally Hickey, was it? It's not Northern Ireland. I know Mavanway. I I know it's in Clare. I had I have no important love to Derry accent. I have no idea why all of a sudden I was speaking with a funny accent. I really don't. Bally Bally Hickey in Clare and Tipperary. Bally E Hick Hick Hickey Hickey Oh Hickey's town. So it's from a name. The O'Hickeys were an eminent family of medical doctors. They were the hereditary physicians to the O'Briens, Lord of Thomond, for which they had free land. And no doubt the Ballyhickey in Clare near Clooney was their hereditary estate as well as that in Tipperary. There you go. So it's 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 Bal Bally O'Hickey. Is it Bally Ronan, is it? No, no, okay, somebody wants Bally Ronan, right? Bally Rory, Bally Ruckin, Bally Ruin, Bally Rush, Bally Rush Boy, Bally Rushley, Bally Sally. Bally Scally, Bally Scandal <laughs> in our man. That's a scandalous place if ever I heard one. Bally Scandal. <laughs> there are so many funny town names in Ireland. But of course, remember, these are anglicised from the Irish. What were, what were we looking for? Bally, Bally Ronan. Read the remarks, Anthony. Lol. <laughs> there are so many Ballys. Ha ha ha. Yes. It's not in Northern Ireland. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Was the Robber Ireland's first documented case of a serial killer? Genocide, huh? Yeah. Um, Bally Ronan. Sorry, I was looking for Bally Ronan. Bally Rowan. Did you say it was Bally Ronan? B A L L uh, Sasha. Uh, no, there's no Bally Ronan list. Oh, there is. Yes, indeed. In several counties. Bally Ronan. Oh, Ronan's town. That's all it says. That's very boring. But anyway, I'm sorry to have to disappoint you on that front. We've gone down an Irish rabbit hole, says Mavanway. We certainly have. But sure, isn't that what uh, uh, Irish people are renowned for? I should mention that. Let me just find it first. <laughs> if I can find it, if I have the right volume, that is. Yes. 
So uh, I am here looking at a translation by Kuno Meyer of Machniver Ha Find, which is published in uh, Eru, the journal Eru. I think it's volume one it's published in. Yes, it's volume one, published uh, in 1904. So I'll just read, right, just, just to give it a, a, an example of, so this is a translation by Kuno Meyer, who's a, who's a, a, a German uh, philologist of, of Celtic languages, uh, German born. And um, so just to compare the, the sort of direct literal translation, bearing in mind that this is more than a century old and that the language is probably inclined to be a bit archaic. So here is a direct translation, whereas Stevens is obviously using license. Thereupon the women bade farewell to the women warriors and told them to take charge of the boy till he should be fit to be a warrior. And so the boy grew up till he was able to hunt. On a certain day, the boy went out alone and saw ducks upon a lake. He sent a shot among them, which cut off the feathers and wings of one, so that a trance fell upon her. And then he seized her and took her with him to the hunting booth. And that was Finn's first chase. He afterwards went with certain cards, cards to flee from the sons of Morna. That's uh, cards which is uh, friends, isn't it? And was with them about Krutta. These were their names, Futh and Ruth and Regna of Moifei and Chemla and Olpe and Rogain. There, there scurvy came, up, came upon him and therefrom he became a scald, whence he used to be called Jevna the Bald. At that time, there was a reaver in Leinster, Fiacal, the son of Kona. And we had Fiacal in the other story. Then in Figul, Fiacal came upon the Karges and killed them all save Jevna alone. So you can see here, that is the, the episode uh, where all the poets are killed uh, by Fiacal. After that, he was with Fiacal, the son of Kona, in his house in Seskan Ur Urviol. The two women warriors came southwards to the house of Fiacal, the son of Kona, in search of Jevna, and he is given to them. And when they take and when they take him with them, and then they take them with them from the south to the same place. Um, the other interesting thing about the Fionn tales is that Magniver ha Find is actually only contained in one manuscript. Um, let me just tell you exactly which one now. And just give me one moment. Please bear with me. I do apologize for this interruption in service. Uh, it's in the monograph but it's easier if i search the pdf rather than try to scan through the book uh, i'll tell you exactly where it is there is only one manuscript telling of mcneever hafind now remember that in one of the in next week's episode or the, or the week after we're going to be telling retelling the story of how fionn caught the salmon of knowledge at the boyne uh, with finnegus the wise uh, and how he came upon all of the knowledge um That's really strange. Where is that? Can't find it. Um, where, um, you know, the the number of folk renditions of that tale, in other words, stories, uh, the story of the Salmon of Knowledge is told and was recorded by the Folklore Commission a century ago, nearly a century ago, in many different places around Ireland, including places along the Boyne. Uh, and they all differ in some detail, and they're all similar in many details. Um, and the remarkable thing is that those are the folk versions that survived orally, separate to any manuscript tradition in the Middle Ages that came down to us in modern times. Now, I don't know if Stevens, like the likes of, um, you know, um, Crofted Croker and W.B. Yeats, etc., who collected stories and, and, and Hyde and all of those. I don't know whether he was telling this uh, as a, a retelling, a version of it that he had been told orally, or whether he was getting the manuscript version and basically flowering it up. It sounds like he might have been doing both, to be honest. Um, terribly sorry for this delay. Okay, MacNeever have Find. Yeah, it's in a manuscript in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Is where it is, and it's it's probably manuscript one eight one one eight seven two or something like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's not even in, for instance, the Book of Leinster or Lauren here or one of those. It's in one of those obscure, um, to more obscure uh, manuscripts. Mac Mann is saying good afternoon from Midwest USA. Hello and thank you for joining us, although we are almost finished at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I have, I'm lucky enough to have copies of these things. I have a copy of uh, MacNeever Hafind in the Irish, which is in, um, it's in uh, Revu Celtic, Volume 5. Uh, just can't, that's Volume 3. Do I have Volume 5 as a printed book or do I only have it as a PDF is the question. Voivu Celtic. Excuse me. Mac, there we go. Look. I have it marked. Don't forget. Machniver <laughs> Hafind. The text is preserved. So, so just to recap, I know we're finished. We're nearly finished. Just to recap, what we've been hearing from Stevens is a, a version of the boyhood deeds of Fionn. Finn McCool, um, with great detail, more detail than is contained in the only manuscript version, which is Machniver Hafind contained, which I'll, I'll read a little bit about the manuscript in a moment. Um, I wonder, does it, does it say uh, in the book, you know, is he retelling it from oral versions that were... Um, you know, present or, uh, you know, that were extant at the time. James Stevens, poet and storyteller, was born in Dublin in 1880. From 1915 to 1924, he was registrar of the National Gallery in Dublin. He spent the remaining years of his life in London, where he broadcast frequently for the BBC. Magic, humour, enchantment, beauty. The, lit the litany of praise for James Stevens's wonderful rendition of Irish legends has never ceased since it was first published 70 years ago. And they remain today as they always were, a feast of fantasy for all ages and for the young at heart of every age. Yeah, MacNeever Hafind. This text is preserved in the well-known Bodleian Codex, Laud 610, where it occupies about six pages and a half, beginning in the middle of the folio, 118A, and ending abruptly on the top of folio 121b. Part of it has been printed twice already, first by O'Donovan in the fourth volume of the Oceanic Society's Transactions in 1859, and again this year, 1881, by Mr. David Common for the Gaelic Union. As to the deficiency of both which editions, see a letter from me to the Academy of August 13th, 1881. In the following print, the reader has a faithful rendering of the text as it stands in the manuscript. I have added, however, a punctuation of my own, except in the poem ascribed to Finn, which, as it offers a great many difficulties, some of which I have not been able to overcome, I thought best to print entirely as it reads in the manuscript. Besides, I have corrected several, several palpable mistakes of the scribe, but the reading of the manuscript will then be found noted below the text. And uh, he, he he lists then a series of irregularities, and so what follows then is basically uh, a, a a faithful rendition of Machniver Hafind, uh, and and in see that in in just she is, is basically on just she is, uh, here below uh, Machniver ha, and um, the boyhood deeds Mach being you know a youth or a boy, Niver ha uh, being the deeds uh, in in Irish. And uh, it only takes up, let me, let me see, in terms of, shouldn't be licking my fingers, still a, yes. Yeah, it's about eight pages, maybe maybe seven or eight pages. And so I've actually marked here the, the, the portion of the tale that deals with the Salmon of Knowledge is one paragraph, which is really extraordinary. Shek mlíana do finicus for bone co urgni iach lina fake. Now, roughly translated, and, and I'm not a scholar uh, of Old Irish or, or Middle Irish, uh, seven years, uh, Finnegus was on the Boyne uh, seeking the, uh, or, or on the verge of Lynn Fake, the Fake's Pool. Ar de Bui a Tarngire de O Fake do Tomalch 
August Ken ni na einfish itcher irum. Uh, and O in this case, EO is the word for salmon, not Bradon as we know it in the popular sort of modern Irish, we call it Bradon Fasa. O, EO was another word for uh, salmon. Frith imradon, <laughs> speaking of, Ocus do Harvad do Jevna imoro ibradon do Funya, Ocus Asbert on Phila Frisch, Ken ni don Bradon do Tomolj, Dobert in Gila, Aaron Bradon ir ir na Funya. Uh, that's the fire, isn't it? Fuenya is fire. In our tumlish ni don bradon agula, ol in filla. So the the poet, ol uh, ol in filla means said the poet, as in said Finnegus. Nito ol in gula, acht mo ordu do loskish akus dorodos in biolu irtain. Kia hanyum fil ortsa agula olche, and this is the agula is. Uh, a boy like a gilly uh kia hanam phil orza agila basically finnegus is asking him what his name is jevna olin gila jevna says the boy finn do anam old she agila august is dutch tucket in bradon dia tumult august is too in finn kofir what he's basically saying there to him is no your name is not jevna it is finn Find in old Irish F I N D, and he's basically telling him that you have been fated, it is your destiny, you're the one who was supposed to get uh, the wisdom of the fish. Tunlidge in Gila in Bradon Irton is age shin tra dorot in fish dofin e anton de berid a ordon in a biolu August noha na tria chenum lega. August na falchiha an yerum uh, in ni do bij a anfish. That is as close as you're going to get. And uh, for real experts, consult somebody who's an, uh, uh, who's, who's more knowledgeable in in the pronunciation of Middle uh, and, and Old Irish than 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 I. However, I will give you the literal translation of that uh, as it is rendered by uh, Kuno Meyer. Seven years, Finnegus had been on the boy watching the salmon of Fake's pool. For it had been prophesied of him that he would eat the salmon of Fake, when nothing would remain unknown to him. The salmon was found, and Jevna was then ordered to cook the salmon, and the poet told him not to eat anything of the salmon. The youth brought him the salmon for cooking it. Hast thou eaten anything of the salmon, my lad? says the poet. No, says the youth, but I burnt my thumb and I put it into my mouth afterwards. What is thy name, my lad, says he. Jevna, says the youth. Finn is thy name, my lad, says he. And to thee was the salmon given to be eaten, and verily thou art the Finn. <laughs> Sounds like something from the Bible, doesn't it? Verily he said upon to him, thereupon the youth eats the salmon. It is that which gave the knowledge to Finn, to wit, whenever he put his thumb into his mouth, he sang through Chenyam Lyja, Lyja and whatever he had been ignorant of would be revealed to him. Brilliant. There you go. Shouldn't have read that this week because we're going to be reading the Salmon of Knowledge in James Stevens' account next week. But anyway, thought you might be interested. Salmon is... Uh, how do you pronounce that, uh, Mavanwe? E-O-G? Og? Og? E-O-G? Yeah. Uh, I think the O, the E-O in Irish, I'm not sure if it's pronounced E-O or, or just O. But uh, I must uh, try to determine that. Um... Uh, more clearly at some point. Anyway, Shine, I should remind you before leaving that the Mythical Ireland 22, 2022 calendar is going to print this week. Make sure to pre-order your copy um, and as soon as I get copies back from the printer, which will hopefully be next week, I will start dispatching the pre-orders to the various pardon me, destinations around the world. Also, don't forget to get your pre-order in for the Mythical Ireland uh, new revised expanded edition which I am proofreading at the moment and which will hopefully go to print uh, before the end of yes, I hopefully all going well, it will be gone to print by Samhain, it will be gone to print by, by Halloween, it will be gone to print by the end of the month and that's mythicalireland.com is the website where you can pre-order the calendar and the book, but the calendar will be printed first and I'll have copies available soon, it has been proofread in its entirety 
and it is ready to go. So I'll be sending it off in the next day or two. Thanks indeed for all for joining us. First of all, uh, for all the lovely comments and interaction, it's always uh, wonderful uh, to gather with you, uh, fabulous uh, people. Um, and I uh, hope we'll see you again very shortly. Don't forget to keep an eye on things on the Facebook page, Mythical Ireland, and also on the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook. If you're a Twitter person, I do also update on Twitter regularly and indeed Instagram. Uh, and don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button wherever that is down here or down here. Uh, hit the subscribe button so you get notified. We've just passed 15,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is brilliant. And if you want to support Mythical Ireland, don't forget, as always, that you can support us at patreon.com forward slash mythical and become a patron chuck us a couple of quid every month and in return you get lots of bonus content thanks indeed everyone wherever you are in the world to those in oceania where it is tuesday morning and the beginning of a new spring day the very best to you for today so for those of you who are watching in in europe and in the middle east uh have a great night to those, all of our friends in the United States, in Canada, and in South America, uh, and of course, Central America, we wish you a very good day. We hope you have a great one. We'll see you very, very soon, hopefully before too long. Thanks for joining in. That has been episode number 155 of Live Irish Myths, begun on the 12th of March, 2020. We will have the second and third parts of the boyhood of Finn uh, coming soon. In the meantime, Slán go fóll, and Ikawa Kolosov and all of that. The main one is Togo Buggy. Definitely take it easy. Bye bye now. Slong of all. <laughs>